Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Northern Virginia where we're covering the 30th Annual Surface Navy Association's Conference and Trade Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS. And we have with us uh, United States uh, Navy Rear Admiral Ron Boxall, who is the uh, N96, the Director of Surface Warfare uh, Requirements. And in, in many cases, you are one of the big guys uh, at this show, sir. Happy New Year and thanks very much for taking some time with us. Well, thank you, Vago. It's good to be here. This is a big event for us here and we're very excited to go have uh, meet with all the uh, vendors and all the people here that uh, help talk about the future of surface warfare. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bittersweet time. There were obviously uh, the unfortunate incidents last year, two non-deadly incidents, but then the two deadly incidents that claimed the lives of 17 sailors. There have been two assessments on that. Uh, Admiral Davidson, uh, Fleet Forces Command, did his assessment of the accidents, uh, and then you had the strategic uh, readiness uh, review that Gary Roughhead, uh, former CNO, Mike, Michael Baer, the Defense Business Board uh, chairman put together. Talk to us a little bit about how both of those reviews are affecting requirements at your end. What are the things that you're gonna have to do and address as, uh, as the Baron, the Surface Warfare Baron? Well, as you know, we're still working through those recommendations. Uh, we, you can tell how important this is for us uh, as a Surface Navy that you know, the Secretary of the Navy himself uh, puts together this his group of uh, experts, as did we with Admiral Davidson, our top surface warfare officer and our fleet commander. Uh, so we're take, looking across the range of recommendations and there's some things which come out right away and things that we, you know, we can get our hands around very quickly. So for a resource sponsor, my job is generally programming things out. Uh, it takes a little time to do that. So we're trying to find out what things out there we can do right away. Some of those are resource driven, some are organizational driven, some are driven by, uh, you know, we gotta, we gotta go back and relook at and take the problem really uh, flesh it all out. From my perspective right now, the immediate uh, answers that we have is we have some funding put in in 18. Uh, we're waiting for a bill to be uh, introduced uh, and, and uh, an, uh, an appropriation to come out. Uh, when that does, we hope there'll be some uh, additional funds put in there to help us get towards a couple initial things. We know we got to put some improvement into some trainers. Uh, we're going to integrate the combat trainer into our bridge uh, integrated Navy seam, er, uh, navigation and seamanship trainer that we use right now uh, to make it even better to get more of that team concept and to take that. So th that's a quick uh, one that we're trying to get out in 18. There's some other stuff we're thinking about uh, as we go forward in 19 and, and certainly more in 20. So there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, we are, you've seen some of the actions that have already been taken by the fleet commander uh, out in the Pacific. Uh, so we'll continue to follow those uh, where we can apply additional resources to solve some of those problems. We'll continue to do so uh, from a manning and training uh, piece and possibly from uh, you know, equipment as we see it uh, needed to be done. How long do you think the process will take for you guys to digest and for you to continue to refine those plans? Because again, the actions you're taking now are going to be producing fruit you know, three, four, five years downstream. Well, keep in mind, that's what I do. I mean, I'm a resource sponsor. It takes time to program the money. It takes time to ensure that we're solving the right problem. Uh, so some of this will be done right away. We do get, you know, one year money to go do things right away. We have money that we can reprogram if we think that's what we need to do. If, if it's something we need to do, we're going to go do it. So that's, you know, but from a resource perspective, long term for changing large systems, uh, you know, we want to make sure we get that right. And so we'll, we'll continue to evaluate those. But there's some quick things that we are going to do, and it's not going to be an issue of, oh, it takes too long, we don't have enough money to do so, we will get after those things. But this is part of a larger view of organization, training, how we do things, uh, looking at the manning and all those, as you've seen, you've seen the report. Uh, so I think at some point, um, you know, we will take these initial actions, there'll be kind of a midterm of things we have to go look at, and there'll be some which we decide uh, that we do want to do, it'll take you know years to generate if, if there is in fact uh, those types of recommendations. So uh, don't mistake the fact that uh, because I'm the resource sponsor that right. we're not going to do things quickly, we are. Uh, my focus as the resource sponsor is generally that future programmed force, so making long-term changes and things like that uh, it's a little bit longer to shift the rudder on those things, but we're going to move out on those recommendations. We have to. Um, as, as the resource sponsor, what impact from those four accidents? I mean, some two of them are going to be worse significant impacts on, on the ships themselves. I mean, one was a grounding and minor collision with a fishing vessel, but the other two were serious collisions. What sort of resources are going to have to go? And, and what sort of disruption does that make for the availability of these high-end missile ships that we need and are in such demand, particularly uh, in the Pacific? Well, again, this is kind of the fleet commander to, to look at the assets we have and make those types of, uh, we, we, we'll be moving ships to accommodate mission as we see fit, as, as the fleet commander sees fit. 
Uh, my job here is about uh, getting those ships repaired. So certainly there's impact to those ships that we have already planned to be repaired. Uh, we have to look at um, you know, the cost itself. I mean, there's going to be some substantial costs to get those up to speed. We want to make sure that as we repair them, we look at the opportunity to ensure that they're updated uh, as, you know, to make them as effective as they, can, as they can be. So there are definitely ramifications. Uh, we're working with the Hill to ensure, and they've been very supportive of ensuring that we get these ships back out to the fleet as quickly as we can. Uh, but they're going to take some time, and uh, we want to do it deliberately. Uh, so there certainly is an impact. Uh, when you have uh, sudden things like this occur, it disrupts kind of the plan that you had. And uh, I, I'm confident that we're going to recover fine with that. We just got to get through the initial uh, uh, adjustment of how and when we're going to do that. Uh, and then we'll move out from there. Do you have any, any sense on what the cost for repairing those two ships are going to be? Uh, it's going to take some time. I don't have them right in, in front of me. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, we've seen these types of incidences with other ships before, and those are uh, you know, there's going to be some significant costs. I don't have them with me right now. I don't, it Understand. wasn't, yeah, but anyway, it's, it's significant. Um, let, me, let me take you. Another big uh, ship program that everybody is very much focused on is the frigate. Uh, that's uh, been the talk of several uh, Surface Navy Association uh, events. And what some folks are saying is that the Navy is moving on to a frigate without an analysis of alternatives. Uh, you know, uh, Ron O'Rourke of the Congressional uh, Research Service has said this, you know, that, that you know, and, and in fact there are those who say that we moved into LCS, the Navy moved into LCS without an analysis of alternative. How do you uh, address and answer those folks who say, you know, in trying to correct one potential mistake, the Navy may be walking into another potential mistake in how it goes about uh, doing this, this, this new frigate? Well, there's a couple things we have that are different now than, than maybe even with LCS. So LCS, uh, as you know, we were already going to be downsizing to a frigate. And most everything we've done now uh, with the new frigate design that we've proposed is going to improve on what we already had. So we're going to get better. That's the starting point. The question is, is how much analysis do you do? Uh, well, we have already included some of this in some of our future surface combatant work. We're looking at the, the small surface combatant is really where the future frigate will fit. And we have already seen the benefits of having uh, the capabilities that we're looking at on there used in war games. We've tried that. Uh, as I've talked to Ron, uh, myself, I've said, hey, look, we're going to continue to refine that analysis going forward. We have not gone out with a request for proposal. We won't do that till 20. So we have a little time to kind of ensure that we value those things that we think we need to change in the frigate. But ultimately, we think we have it about right. Remember, we're going with commercial, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, government furnished equipment programs of record that we know already are largely included in the frigate. So we know what the analysis for those systems are. We know what VLS brings. We know what an ESA radar brings. We know what air defense capability that brings. So we, it, it is not completely in a vacuum. There has been significant analysis that's been done for that. Um, but uh, fair that we can continue to get better at that as we go forward. Um, you, you did say that the RFP is a little uh, ways out. I was talking to a friend of mine, a uh, retired flag officer, and his answer was, um, yeah, you know, we don't have many, there aren't many requirements for this as long as it's, you know, less than $999 million, uh, you know, so it doesn't build, break the billion dollars. He was being, he was being funny. Uh, but what are some of the requirements that you are now seeing that need to be core for this vessel? How much does it look like a Perry? How much does it not look like a Perry? How important is our ASW features like Perry or Masker belts and those sorts of things? Um, you know, t talk to us a little, you know, range. Talk to us about what are the calculus and your thinking, you know, as you guys are starting to, again, you know, continually refining it, but what are some of the base things that really matter to you uh, as, as a surface warfare officer? Well, I'm glad you asked that because that's actually what I'm going to be talking about today in my pitch here in about an hour, so you're getting scooped here a little. I'm getting scooped a little bit, but uh, the reality is that we're looking for commonality. I mean, obviously, when you build a, uh, a distributed maritime force, you want those ships to be able to interoperate. You want them to be very fast in their ability to upgrade capabilities. So uh, I want what I have on the destroyers of the future to be able to match very clearly with these. So when we, when we have a, a VLS vertical launch system, when we have an ESA radar that we know how it works, uh, when we have a combat system that we think uh, can, can take the common source code like we do, um, with our Aegis right now, we, we think that that's probably a good environment uh, to going forward so that I don't have to upgrade every element of the system every time we make an upgrade. So commonality is core. It's how I get speed, it's how I get agility, it's how I get costs to be under control, and how I get the benefits of the man, train, equip. Train one set of people that know how to use it on all different platforms and uh, sparing and all those different uh, pieces that, that uh, get more complex the more combinations you have. 
And uh, how big of a challenge is that? Because we moved away from a commonality model to each blocks of Aegis as being, you know, each block of three ships almost being a little bit different as they were going along. How big of a sustainment challenge is that? And I want to walk that into uh, an LCS sustainability question, but right now, how big of a challenge is that? Well, I think uh, you hit it right. We were kind of were going in the wrong direction with creating more baselines because that was, uh, uh, the way we were kind of, we wanted to get capability and we didn't really think a lot, or if we did, we didn't want to pay for the uh, commonality after the fact. And so we, we kind of did with what we did with the best we could uh, for the amount of money we had. Going the other way, we are trimming down the number, number of baselines. I mean, right now today, uh, we have taken the Bunker Hill, which is really our oldest cruiser out there, uh, and we have upgraded her from baseline eight to baseline nine. Uh, that's a open architecture, uh, open, source library upgrade by making it a common computing suite we've we've got the capability on an older ship with newer compatibility with uh, the other ships that are out there that's the future we're looking for now is it always going to work exactly one for one no the hardware is not going to be exactly the same but if they can you know much as you get an iphone 5 you get an iphone 6 you get an iphone 7 uh, we're our idea is to have it operating in a common environment and upgrading those individual applications so that we can get out there much more quickly with upgrades to capability as we need to. And a little bit of a shout out to our uh, mutual friend, uh, Dick Diamond, who is commanding officer of, uh, of, uh, of Bunker Hill. Um, yeah, let me ask you about LCS um, sustainability, uh, if, if we can. Um, two, two quick questions. One is an LCS sustainability question. Now that we're getting the ships out, they have their maintenance challenges still that we're working our way. What's the long-term sustainability model for these ships to get the kind of um, uh, underway time that the Navy is demanding of these ships and needs of these ships in order to make a smaller force go farther? And I have one follow-up. Okay, well actually, uh, I, I, I would argue that we're getting a lot better with LCS. The first uh, LCS, our first four ships that we came out, we, we, we bought with you know, rdt and &E money, two, two sets, two different variants. Uh, as we go forward with LCS, um, we are now in the block buy, and we backfitted a lot of those lessons learned, almost a prototyping type model. Now, to say, so all our estimates are based on those first four ships. That will stabilize over time. Uh, we are also looking at, to the extent we can afford to do so, upgrading and backfitting increases in sustainability, survivability, and lethality on those ships. So uh, we have to find that right combination for what we can afford going forward, but um, you know, as we, as we have bought some systems that aren't necessarily compatible, you know, maybe we have an opportunity to get more common going forward with, as we retrofit uh, during upgrades. And the key uh, part of this conference is surface warfare and cross-domain integration, something that's very important to the uh, Chief of Naval Operations who's going to be talking this afternoon. Um, but if you look at your organization, it's, it's an effort to try to break stovepipes and, and from the standpoint of the CNO, but you still have so stovepipes. You know, you're still the N96 and you're a stovepipe and the 95 and the 97. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing to break those stovepipes, to work across uh, domains, because when, it look, when you look at resources, there's still, those resources are still in the stovepipes. So my job as the N96 is to ensure that the programs for the platforms and systems that I support uh, get down into a program and they're funded adequately. So that's kind of a stovepipe model, I don't disagree with you. However, we have rechanged the, the N9 organization. It exists specifically to get more of an integration view. So not only am I responsible for executing that money and programming uh, by platform and system, but I'm also part of a larger group of N9 folks who will be speaking at a panel tomorrow about how we make the best of every one of those types of platforms. How do we make surface ships do what what gives most value to the larger architecture, submarines, aircraft, our systems, that, uh, our networks. So that's kind of the discussion. I have been given re responsibility that don't just exist in my stovepipe of shipboard platforms and systems, but things that cover cross-domain issues like uh, 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 ASW. ASW, uh, ASW, for example, that's not mine, for example, but uh, off, you know, uh, surface ASUW mission. Right. I can look across, hey, how do planes, how do ships, how do submarines uh, attack this problem and where's the synergy to be gained? Where's the best value in our architecture? And those are what we'll be looking at, trying to talk about tomorrow. Uh, and I feel like we we have made big strides. I've been in the integration side, I used to work in N8F. Right. Uh, Admiral Kilby has taken over as N9I, uh, specifically to bring a more uh, uh, corporate view of our portfolio across all platforms, no matter who's funding them. 
Do, is there, let me, I mentioned ASW, and you're right, any surface warfare was probably a better example to use. But from an ASW standpoint, you know, I was talking to, a, to an AF, what, a old ASW hand, and he had a concern about having an all active sonar, for example, that's the mission module that's going to be on the littoral combat ships. And if you talk to submariners, that makes them very, very uh, itchy at the prospect that somebody is going to be hammering away active all the time because that's painting everything that's in that in that body of water. Is that one of the challenges that there's, the Navy's going to have to overcome? Because if you look at it from a P-8 standpoint, also there's a lot of active sonar happening on that aircraft and, and a little bit less passive. Do you think that there has to be a shift toward greater passive uh, detection? Uh, especially in what could be some close quarter ASW fights in the future that we might have to face? Well, I, again, I'm not going to get down in specific capability uh, about our platforms, whether it be air surface or subsurface, but uh, I can tell you that the LCS uh, mission package going forward that we, you know, we're know, we going to try to IOC that here in the next year, um, that brings a lot of capability, not just on the active side, but on the passive side as well. And it will have an, inter, an, oper, uh, an ability to interoperate with other platforms, whether it be subsurface or air, uh, to optimize, again, that, that contribution to the larger network. So wait and see. We'll see when it gets out there. But uh, thank you again for, uh, for, for seeing me today. Sir, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Best of luck at this year's SNA. All right. Thanks, Vago.